Happy Easter, friends. That's right. It's still Easter. Hopefully you know this. Dwayne uh, let us know last week, just like Christmas, the 12 days of Christmas, there actually are 12 days of Christmas. It's not just a silly song or a good excuse to buy geese or leaping ladies. Easter is also 50 days. 50 days, a season of us celebrating the resurrection of Christ. Now, every Sunday, the prayer book will tell us, is a chief feast, a remembrance of the resurrection of our Lord. But for these 50 days, we have a special opportunity, a special chance to really sit with the resurrection, to sit with the question, what does resurrection mean to us today? How does this world turning upside down event really shape our lives? Or how does it even touch our lives in our everyday moments? And so for this journey toward Pentecost, I want to encourage us to walk this Easter road, and I want to give us three words to focus in on today. The three words I want to share with you are peace, doubt, and life. Just before the text that we just heard a few moments ago, we have the great Easter story where Mary goes to the tomb and she finds it empty. She encounters the risen Christ but doesn't recognize him at first. She thinks he's perhaps the gardener. And there eventually she is seeing Jesus. He reveals himself to her by saying her name, Mary. And that familiar voice opens her eyes to see that Jesus is the one who's actually right there in front of her. She rushes to him and grabs onto him and he says, don't cling to me, but go to my brothers and sisters and to your brothers and sisters. Tell them, that I'm going up to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. And the Scripture tells us that Mary left and announced to the disciples the first Easter sermon that's only five words long, I have seen the Lord. That's the message. She goes back, she tells them all, and that's where the story picks up today. Now they've heard the good news. They have received the first Easter sermon But where are they? Hiding. Behind locked doors. Tucked away. They've heard the good news. Some of them have even seen the empty tomb. And yet they're still tucked away. With fear. That's where Jesus comes to them. In the midst of their fear. Behind locked doors that no authority could get through. That's where Jesus meets them. He comes to them in the midst of their fear, in the midst of their mourning, in the midst of their confusion, and He gives them the great blessing, peace be with you. And that same blessing is the blessing that Christ speaks to us today, no matter where we are. Peace be with you. This is why for centuries we have passed the peace with those same words, and we'll do that in a few minutes. But when we do that, we're not just greeting each other, and that's why it's really important that we take that moment seriously. I think, you know, it's kind of in the middle of the service, so we've we've had a lot of listening, a lot of sitting still. We want to move and shake, and we want to, you know, get the wiggles out, and we want to say, oh, I love that suit. Is that a new tie? But instead, we have an opportunity to look at each other, brothers and sisters, friends and strangers, and say the same words that Christ says to his disciples. Peace be with you. Can we practice that together? Peace be with you. Now, I know you can say it, so I want to hear it in a few minutes. But think about that for a moment. That we, in the middle of our service, we greet each other with the words of the risen Christ. And he says it time and time again. In just the small reading we have here, he says it at least three times. Just in case you didn't get it, peace be with you. Oh, you weren't listening. Peace be with you. A week later, no, really. (laughs) Peace be with you. It's a hope. And it's also a promise. That when you are afraid, and you are behind closed doors, and you don't want anyone to find you, that Christ can come to you even there. And he does. And he says those same words of blessing. 
peace be with you. They have this incredible moment. This incredible experience where Christ comes in their midst and blesses them and gives them kind of the great commission in John's version. In some ways, this is John's Pentecost. He, he jumps ahead 50 days. He breathes on them the Holy Spirit and says, receive this power. Now go into the world and give the peace I've given to you to others. Forgive people. Tell them the good news that they are forgiven, that there is nothing that can separate them from the love of God. Go. It's a wonderful moment. But Thomas isn't there. The first word is peace. The second word I want to offer you today is doubt. We don't know why Thomas wasn't there. I've heard a couple sermons that speculate some different reasons, but he isn't. And so we give Thomas a, a bad, he gets a bad reputation sometimes. If someone has questions, I, I grew up in a church where people would say, you don't want to be a doubting Thomas. I had questions about evolution and, and where the dinosaurs were on Noah's Ark. I mean, how could there be room for the Tyrannosaurus Rex and the panda bears? I wanted to know these things. And I remember someone saying, oh, don't be a doubting Thomas. We give, it's such a terrible, poor Thomas. But notice, of course he had doubts. Of course. He wasn't there. And I like to think that it's not just him doubting the resurrection, he's also doubting the community. Because they were there. Something has happened in the community's life and they have been changed. They've received the good news. They are not the same they were a couple days ago. But he wasn't there. He didn't get breathed on. He didn't receive the Holy Spirit. He didn't get the, the two, three times, peace be with you. Of course he has doubts. Wouldn't you? I do. And they let me come up here. Of course he has doubts. And that's where Christ meets him. A week later, they're gathered together and Thomas is with the community this time. Again, we don't know. It, it, for some reason, he still has his doubts and yet he's still there. There's a sermon just there <laughs> that we show up even with our doubts, even with our questions. We're still welcome. And not only with our fear, but also our doubts and our questions. That's where Christ meets us. Jesus doesn't scold him. He comes to him. He doesn't wag his finger at him. He opens his side to him. And he says, if you want to touch, touch. If you want to feel me, feel me. And in some ways, friends, every Sunday when we come to the table, we're the same position. We're coming for a glimpse, a touch, a taste of God's presence. Jesus doesn't scold him. He embraces him with his body. You know, I've, I've never really known someone who left the church or who left Christianity or had questions about faith and they didn't have a good reason. I meet people all the time on campus and I have conversations with college students and young adults and youth and they've got questions. And they're usually really good. They're really inspiring, actually. They've got doubts about the story they've been given and normally they're really good. I was pastoring a church a couple years ago when a woman uh, came to me at some point and says, you know, I don't really know if I even believe in God trying to scare me off. And I was like, I, I don't know if I do one or two days a week. Really? Well, yeah, have you seen the news? It's hard to believe all these things. We have our questions, we have our doubts, of course we do. Earlier, a couple weeks ago, uh, we had adults join us with our confirmation students, and we got to share some of the things they enjoyed about being an Episcopalian, and, and one of the phrases was, you don't have to check your brain at the door. I love that, because I can't. I have my questions, I have my doubts, I have my, my curiosities, and they actually fuel my faith. And even in the moments where they feel overwhelming, I have Thomas, who tells me that that's where Christ comes and meets us in the midst of our doubt. Peace, doubt, and life. 
the ending of this story, after Thomas has this beautiful moment, we have John's original ending of the gospel. You can tell because he kind of ties everything up in a bow, you know? He reads these words. Then Jesus did many other things. They're not included here. You'll have to get the cliff notes later. But these were written so that you'll believe, and that by believing, you'll have life in his name. The gospel is written so that we would see Jesus. That's why we're here. That's why all of this is here. That's why this beautiful building with its incredible architecture, the stained glass windows, the murals, the table, the robes, all of it, it's all here for one purpose, and that's so that we would see Jesus. And that by seeing Jesus, we would know life. In John 10.10, it says not just life, but life to the full. Real, vibrant, bursting life. The preciousness of life. And like the disciples, this happens in the midst of our life. When we're afraid. When we're distancing ourselves from others. When we have questions and doubts that haunt us and keep us from the life of community, that's where Christ meets us. And in those moments, we find life in unexpected places. Maybe you know this, you've met people who are alive, but they're not living. And as a pastor, I've been privileged to be with people on their deathbed who are truly alive. It's a funny thing. Jesus comes to give us abundant life, bursting forth like a flower that you see in the morning that you didn't see in the night before. Like nibbling on a little girl's ears. We don't know what's going on in each other's lives sometimes. We don't. I don't know the pain or the fear that you brought with you today, but I can still come to you and say, peace be with you and promise it on your behalf. I don't know the doubt and the questions that you may have. I don't know all the good reasons for them, but I can come to you and say, peace be with you. And in that communal peace, we can find life together. The church doesn't exist for itself. We're not here just to look nice, although you look beautiful, let me tell you. We're here to encounter life. Free, uninhibited life. That's what the resurrection is all about. No matter how dark it is, no matter how defeated we are, no matter how anxious or uncertain we are of what the future holds, life is ours. Peace is ours. May peace be with you. Amen.